Yes, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Arman Pandey. I'm a psychiatrist uh, trained under Dr. Nilesh Shah and various other uh, senior psychiatrists who have spoken to you already and who will be speaking to you in due course of time. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Vaya and the foundation for inviting me to speak here. Uh, the brain and mental health, it's a wonderful concept. Actually, this is something that I have always been thinking about and wondering how to you know, talk about uh, mental illnesses from the perspective of the brain, because that's what it is. You know, mind is a concept, brain is the organ. Whatever happens, whatever is displayed, it is happening because of this organ called as brain. I have uh, been asked to speak on this topic, sexual abuse, insights and prevention. Uh, I think most of you attending this lecture right now are uh, graduates, counselors. Uh, is there anyone who's uh, a school student? Uh, all right. And uh, anyone who's a counselor? Okay. Teachers, mental health professionals, including counselors? All right. So it's a mixed crowd. Uh, I have kept uh, a general uh, idea of different topics that are involved, uh, that are there about sexual abuse. So we can have an interaction depending on what exactly you want to know and what exactly is important for you. Uh, from a personal perspective or from a professional perspective. Sexual abuse, I'm not going to go into the legal technical definition, but it is an action done by a person who understands what this action is. Whether it is an active uh, action or it is due to neglect of certain things that this individual is supposed to do, but is well aware of the consequences. This action is sexual in nature and it is unwanted by the person upon whom it is inflicted. Now, of course, if this person is a minor, legally it, under 18 years of age in our country, or is unable to give consent for any other reason, uh, then uh, for minors, it is considered as child sexual abuse. Okay? But sexual offense could be, of, uh, could be inflicted upon anyone. It could be elderly, it could be young children, it could be adults, it could be men, it could be women, it could be anyone. All right, so that's the broad definition of sexual abuse. Another thing we need to remember that sexual abuse is not equivalent to rape. Yes, rape is the most extreme form of sexual abuse, but it need not always be physical, okay? Passing lewd comments, writing lewd comments on social media platform, uh, touching someone uh, under the guise of an accident, uh, uh, singing songs for someone that the other person finds offensive, stalking someone uh, physically, online, all of this comes under the purview of sexual harassment or sexual abuse, okay? So it's not just limited to physical touch. That's one thing that we need to be very careful and understanding about. Extent of the problem, now by most studies actually in our country, these are, this is data from our country, most studies have pointed out that almost 50 to, almost 40 to 50 percent people report that they have been sexually abused by their late teens, by 16, 17 years of age. Okay, so childhood sexual abuse is probably prevalent in half the population. And the most conservative estimate is at least 20 percent of our population. That is one in five individuals. So every fifth person has been through some form of sexual abuse. India has the largest number of children because we are one of the most populous countries in the world and therefore we have the largest number of children who are sexually molested. Okay, so this is a huge problem. It is not just a topic of discussion. This is a real problem. It has happened to at least 20% of people who are sitting here or it may. So it's very important to think about this from a very personal perspective as well. It's not just theory. There are certain myths which are still prevalent in this age of information and awareness. For example, that girls need to be more careful when it comes to their physical safety. Parents always talk to girls. A lot of parents fail to talk to their boys about their own personal safety. Now research shows, studies show that boys are almost equally 
uh, the victims of sexual offenses, if not more. Certain studies show, in certain communities especially, that boys have undergone sexual offenses more number of times than girls. It's because, again, this reason that parental supervision is less, plus boys are exposed to certain elements which, uh, which may put them under this kind of situation. Okay, so boys are commonly abused. Another myth that is prevalent is that it's some stranger, some weird looking person who would probably indulge in an act like that. 85% of the times, the perpetrator is known to the victim. The victim knows the perpetrator personally. It's not a stranger. All right, so it's very important to know that People have to be careful, kids have to be careful, we have to be careful, even among people that we know personally. Friends of friends. Women or girls can be perpetrators too. It's not always men who sexually abuse others. Yes, the proportion is much higher. We see that perpetrators are mostly men, but women and girls can also sexually abuse other vulnerable population. Okay, I've personally had so many cases, so many instances where people have told me about this. So it's a misconception that if my child is with a woman, uh, then he or she is safe. Okay? It can happen to anyone. It doesn't affect a certain community, a certain social class, certain economic class. Uh, your level of knowledge, awareness does not alone protect you from sexual violence. It happens in marriages. 30% of Indian women report sexual abuse at the hands of their husbands. Over 60% of women in well-off uh, homes report sexual violence. So it doesn't matter what your marital status is, what your economic status is, what your professional status is. You are at risk. Because the most important fact is that this is not an act of sex. It is an act of violence, aggression. Okay, sexual abuse is not about unfulfilled sexual needs or some sexual deviant who's trying to, you know, fulfill his sexual needs. It is an act of violence. It is an act of aggression. Have all of us been aggressive at some point or the other? Right? Even if we don't remember, yes, we have been aggressive. And as we grew older, we learned to modify our aggression. But there are some individuals who fail to do this who are not able to do this, okay? A little bit more about that, uh, uh, I'll talk about in a while. The effects of sexual abuse, especially in children, is very different from what happens in adults. If somebody invades my personal rights, okay, somebody violates my personal rights, my reaction would be physically, mentally, anger, counter aggression. I want to fight this person, okay? But children internalize this anger. And most kids are left feeling extremely afraid, guilty, or ashamed about the whole incident. They don't feel bad about the perpetrator. They feel bad about themselves. This is how the mind of a child works. They tend to internalize these feelings. Children who go through any kind of traumatic experience, including sexual violence, are more prone to develop PTSD, depression, or anxiety disorders as they grow older. Okay, they developed unhelpful coping styles. And all of this happens because of changes in the brain. See, it's not an incidence that one can get over with. You talk about it, you heal the person, and the person is fine. It doesn't work like that. It's a mental scarring, and by mental, I mean it's a scar in your brain. If a person undergoes traumatic brain injury, Okay, no amount of uh, counseling or modifying the social environment is going to help this person because the injury has happened. When uh, the brains are compared of individuals who have undergone any kind of sexual offense and individuals who haven't, these are the changes that are most often found. Not just in humans, in mice models also. The left hemisphere of the brain doesn't develop much. It is underdeveloped and it has more abnormalities than the right. Left hemisphere is there for rational thinking, for logical reasoning. Right hemisphere, on the other hand, is more for emotional processing. 
okay the connection between left and right hemisphere that is disturbed this is a very very consistent finding in all studies that means i am not able to be aware of my emotional reactions i'm not able to modify my emotional reactions i don't know whether this was uh, this has been uh, addressed to you earlier or not but that's one of the reasons why people have let's say anxiety disorders dysregulation of your mood okay and increased neuronal irritability this is seen in eeg findings so this is not just a memory it is a real physical change that happens at neuronal level all right and it cannot be just forgotten and that's the reason why people have all these other problems that develop later on in their brains so uh basically what happens is that because of this one traumatic experience the brain adapts to an extreme the brain becomes a very hyper vigilant organ it thinks that you know the whole world is a very hostile place it's a very dangerous place and i have to be always careful and that's the reason why the stress levels are so high constantly okay so it is actually an adaptation to this traumatic experience or the traumatic environment however the cost of this adaptation is that you cannot really have uh, trustworthy or meaningful relationships with uh, most people or you have things like depression or anxiety as you grow older okay so a lot of side effects happen because the brain tends to adapt in this way okay in the previous slide what i had written about unhelpful coping styles or mistrust we see as people who grow older who have had uh, bad childhood experiences they are unable to trust other individuals so that may mean that they are unable to form you know trusting relationships or in other cases what happens is that unconsciously they get into a cycle of repetitive abusive relationships okay a lot of times when we see people who are in an abusive relationship we do get a history of some kind of childhood abuse often sexual abuse okay so there are you know psychological reasons why this happens um dr nilesh was talking about how biology works okay and how things are physical how things are actually you know there it's not just something which is an idea which is in imagination it's not abstract okay so yes uh, sexual violence for example i was saying that it is an act of aggression now this act of aggression is uh not something which is done impulsively if you think that people who are sexually aggressive are people who are in general very aggressive who cannot control their impulses that's not exactly true i'll give you an example a scenario let's say that i work in an office environment or in an office place and there is this uh, 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 lady who i like okay now we share a professional relationship and one day she walks in wearing clothes that i find are very attractive and i want to give her a compliment okay what would i do what do you think is an appropriate way to behave you're looking nice right hi you're looking nice or you're looking really pretty she wouldn't feel offended if i speak like this however if i were to say something like you're looking really sexy today she will feel offended okay if i am not a person who who has these tendency of being sexually violent then i would not say something like this because i know from experience and from my uh, social cognitive abilities that this will not uh, uh, make her feel good in fact it may make her feel extremely uncomfortable however if i had the other type of tendency i would not be able to get this message i would give this compliment she would probably feel uncomfortable but i wouldn't realize that she is feeling uncomfortable or in some cases in fact some people even derive a little bit of thrill because the other person feels uncomfortable i have been able to make you feel uncomfortable that's the game of aggression a lot of this aggression this type of aggression which is not in self defense it is to establish your authority okay in most cases of violence especially domestic violence and abuse it's all about the power struggle i am stronger than you 
my words can hurt you. You are at my mercy. Your emotions depend on what I do, what I say. Okay? So this is a kind of personality. This is a kind of trait that certain human beings display. This is even evident during childhood. Certain uh, kids, for example, are extremely cruel towards other animals. They hit other animals. Um, they don't understand that the other animal is in pain. Okay? They hit other kids. We see these kind of problems. The behavior is on similar lines, but the actual content is different because the age is different, the environment is different. Okay? So, are we predetermined to be aggressive? Is this always going to be the case? Or can we do something about it? Now, again, we look back to science to give us an answer. And the uh, fact is that overall rates of crime in our human society has been reducing a lot, right? Overall rates of crimes like murder, extreme violence has been going down. People killing each other has gone down. So environment definitely has an influence. And that's because our brain, this organ, has this uh, you know, amazing ability to modify itself. Unlike other organs that we have, our heart and liver cannot change the way they've been born, they will remain like that. But our brain can modul modulate itself to a certain degree. There are limitations to that. Okay, I can improve my mathematical ability, but I can never match the ability of a mathematical genius. Right? So there are limitations to that, but I can modulate my brain to a certain degree. Preventive strategies towards sexual violence have to take this into account. Okay? Only then we will have real success. What has uh, actually research shown us is that when it comes to school-based education on safety behaviors, it works really well in preventing sexual offenses, especially against children and even as adults. Okay, so empowering the child, letting the child know that this is safe touch, this is not safe touch, this is bad touch. What to do, how to recognize, how to prevent. These strategies really are helpful. And most schools have adopted this policy now. Most kids are taught good touch, bad touch. But what I am aware of that this starts at around third, fourth standard, which is quite late. Okay, as soon as the child can comprehend language, it needs to start. The child can say what are the different body parts. The child needs to know what, is, uh, what are the names of the private parts. Penis, vagina, breast, all these terms need to be told to the child. Okay, and safety is something that begins as soon as the child is going to step out of the you know, uh, protected home environment. Even in the protected home environment, there are there is, there is danger lurking around. So as soon as possible, as soon as the child can comprehend. Another set of research has shown that involvement of parents is mandatory because it's not just information. Parents are the ones who will, uh, so even if a child knows, for example, that uh, whatever happened to me was bad touch. Now how to react to this is something that the child would learn from the parents. Am I supposed to speak up for myself or am I supposed to respect my elders and not say anything bad against them? Am I supposed to be extremely cautious and be afraid? Or do I think that, no, things can get better. There are individuals who I can trust, who I can uh, share this information with. So a lot of values and attitudes are communicated by the parents. And of course, like I pointed earlier, a lot of these crimes do happen in the home environment. So parents need to be aware about sexuality and sexual abuse. They need to read signs. Parents, teachers need to read signs of sexual abuse. Okay? People think that uh, children will display some kind of difference, you know, some kind of change in their behavior if they go through something traumatic. But kids are excellent at hiding their feelings, hiding their emotions. In fact, if we go retrospectively, all the adults who say that they were molested in childhood, their caregivers are completely unaware about it. They didn't even know. I was with my daughter. I was with my son. We were traveling somewhere. We were, we were on a vacation. And something happened, and I'm not even aware of it. I only have happy memories of it. So kids are very good at hiding their feelings, hiding their emotions. 
Okay, so parents need to understand this. We need to talk about these things. Comprehensive sexuality education is talking about sexuality uh, from a very positive perspective. Okay, so uh, me and my partner, we also take comprehensive sexuality education workshops for parents, teachers, kids, school staff, wherein we not just talk about safety behavior, but we also draw parameters for safe sex, good relationships, okay? Uh, this is actually the most important thing. If I am uh, thinking about, for example, uh, whether I would uh, smoke or not as I grow older, I need to have certain things set in my mind. If I do not know that something like cigarettes exist in the world, I'm 14 years old, my friends are doing it, I may try it too. But if I know that, yes, this is called a cigarette, this is what it leads to, this is why people do it, and this is why people should not do it, then I'm in a better position to make a decision when I reach there. Similarly, if I have protocols in my head that, you know, I may want to get into a relationship, but this is what is going to be allowed and this is not going to be allowed. These are the parameters of a good relationship. Okay, then I would not let my hormones just take over. All right, so comprehensive sexuality education talks about sexuality in a positive light that yes, it exists, it's not a bad thing, but it's your responsibility. And most important, what I said earlier, so this, the above strategies are to safeguard kids from being a victim. But what about the perpetrators? How can we reduce the actual rate of violent crimes? This is by targeting the future perpetrators. Now, I'm not sure whether this child who's showing some kind of delinquent behavior is going to uh, indulge in a crime as severe as this. So I'm not saying that he's a future criminal. I'm not saying that. But there are certain things that we can learn in retrospect. So a lot of studies have been done in people who have been sexual offenders, okay? And certain things have been found very, very consistent in them. They have, for example, all of them have poor emotional regulation, or uh, they have uh, this extreme uh, aggressive tendencies or disregard for others' feelings and rights. They're just blank. They don't get it that other, another person is suffering. They lack that empathy, okay? And if we are able to uh, screen children who are displaying these tendencies and have an early intervention, then probably the whole scenario might change. Why is the crime rate, for example, of uh, physical assault been reducing? Because parents are talking about it, schools are talking about it, hitting is bad. You may get angry, but don't hit another child. It's not allowed. Don't use bad words, don't use foul words. We talk about that. Why not about sexual offenses? We've got to say very, very clearly that you can't touch someone there. You can't talk about private body parts like this, okay? You cannot point out at someone, so, uh, someone's private parts. You can't comment upon like that uh, on a social media platform. We need to talk about all these things. <clears throat> what you need to know on a personal level, see, I see a lot of young people here, and uh, you may be in a relationship or you may be, uh, Eventually, most of you will be in a relationship. What you need to know is that at personal level, it's very important to be always careful, okay? Your body is your choice, but your responsibility as well. Making boundaries, this is a very, very important thing, okay? What is allowed in my relationship, what is not allowed? My personal boundaries. And these boundaries will go wherever I go whether I'm at my workplace, whether I'm in my bedroom with my wife, whether I am with my friends, whether I'm on, online, uh, on an online platform, I have an existence there also. So whatever happens to my existence there is my responsibility. I have to make boundaries. Who can look at my pictures? Who can comment? Okay? If I do not make these boundaries, people are going to step over. You don't know who. These boundaries have to be with everyone. To not step onto somebody else's boundary and to not let others step into your boundaries, the most important rule is consent, okay? The meaning of consent is simply giving permission or taking permission. Anything that is private, uh, if it is uh, being you know, uh, addressed by another individual, the other person needs to take my consent. 
even to use my phone or to take my pen. My body is the most private thing that I have. So everything regarding it requires consent. We should not just practice giving consent, but also practice taking consent. Okay, asking our partners whether it is okay or not. Is it okay or not? Are you comfortable or not? Simple things like these. Or giving consent that yes, this is fine. No, this is not okay. I want to stop. Okay, no maybes. Maybe means okay, we'll wait. Maybe is not equal to a yes. Only a yes is, an, uh, is equal to yes. Okay? Consent cannot be given by a person who is not in the state to recognize what is happening. You all know the um, tea example for consent? Okay, I invite someone over to have tea with me. And this person said yes earlier. But after coming home, I've made the tea and this person is now saying, no, I don't want to have the tea. I'm not going to force this person to have tea. Same goes with consent. That you said, it, said yes earlier, how can you say no right now? Consent varies from moment to moment. Okay, last time when you were over, you had tea. What's the problem now? You can have tea again. A no means no. Last time it happened doesn't mean that it has to happen again. A person, for example, uh, we went out partying and this person is drunk and is now lying unconscious in my bed, said yes to the tea earlier. I'm not going to make the tea and pour over his or her face. An unconscious person cannot give consent. A sleeping person cannot give consent, even if that person said yes earlier. Okay? So sometimes during physical intimacy, people may fall asleep or people may fall unconscious. That doesn't mean that that person can continue. All right? Consent means a clear-cut yes. And anyone can change their minds at any point, whether it's a guy, whether it's a girl. It's not... Again, the other myth is that we often come across is that, you know, guys are always ready for physical intimacy. No, if you are uncomfortable, you say no, irrespective of your sex and gender. Okay? In marriages, also consent is applicable. Just because you are my wife, you are my girlfriend, doesn't mean that we can be physical whenever I want. No. Body is the most private thing. Nobody owns it but you. All right? So these are some things about consent that we should all remember. And of course, reporting uh, the perpetrators, bringing them out into the open. That's the most important way in which we can reduce these crimes. One offender is not going to stop at one child or one person. It's always a repetitive offense. And unless that person is brought out and exposed, things are not going to change. A simple example, in uh, one of the schools that I visit, uh, they had taken these kids for uh, their kids for a visit in the mall. And these kids uh, are actually, they have some special abilities. So they have uh, either low functioning uh, mental abilities or extreme LD uh, or extreme ADHD. So uh, the, uh, one of the teachers who was with the students noticed that the security guard was touching the girls inappropriately. He was brushing against their chest. And she saw this happen to one. She saw this happen to the second. And before he could do this to the third, she just asked him very loudly that, do you examine everyone like this? Do you check everyone like this? She didn't even point out what exactly was happening. But the guard was completely taken aback. He realized that he was caught. OK? Now, this has instilled a fear in him that he cannot get away with something like this. Even if you can't go to the authorities, report to the police, which would be the ideal case scenario, actually, bring such a person behind bars, even if you can't do that, at least raise your voice. At least let others know that you will stand up. And most of the times, people will support you. Okay, If it's happening to you, raise your voice. If it, hap it is happening to somebody else, raise your voice. You know, people who uh, have these antisocial tendencies could be like 5 to 10%. That means 90% people don't have such tendencies. 90% of the people are going to be with you. Okay, they will empathize with the victim. They will support us. So it's important to report the perps. 1098 is the helpline number. Or someone can go to this website, ncpcr.gov.in, National uh, Commission for Protection of Child Rights. Okay, uh, there is a button. It's a very simple website to use. There's a button for POXO. You Click on that button. It takes you to the next page. There are pictures 
uh, about reporting the incidents, where exactly this incidence has happened, on the playground, at home. So even a person who cannot read clearly can report these incidences. Okay? Uh, all this person has to give is a contact information, either an email address or a phone number. The authorities will contact this person and things can move on for, uh, from there. So a lot of times, you know, unfortunately, even the caregivers could be involved as perpetrators. So in that situation, the state stands with the victim. Okay? So that's what I wanted to talk about. There are so many things that we can actually discuss. So I'm open to questions and discussions from you. So um, uh, what I want to know, there's a lot of questions. And as a parent, there's a lot of anxiety when you listen to something like this. But at the same time, in the change of mixed, va in a world of you know, mixed values and changing values, your personal values and what the children are you know, learning at school, how do you, uh, in a calm way, explain to children that consent actually would not be the only thing when they're small? How do you explain this to them? Uh, the point is that sexual education or education about sexuality is an ongoing process. We need to understand that sexuality doesn't simply mean reproduction or sex per se. It also means, um, for example, knowledge about puberty. It means uh, uh, learning assertiveness skills, how to say no, making decisions. So all these soft skills are also part of sexuality education. What we recommend to parents is that you start talking to your child about various topics, depending on the age, as early as possible. So if, for example, a four-year-old baby is asking, uh, where do babies come from? Okay, you start explaining the process to the kid in the way the child understands. Sticking to the facts, you don't have to uh, talk about everything. So one thing that you're communicating is that any talk about this topic is okay with you. The communication channel is always open. God forbids if something wrong happens, then the child can trust you with this knowledge. And of course, if any questions are there, any mixed uh, signals or misinformation that the child is getting from outside, you know about it. You can question the child from time to time. What do you think about this? Do you know what periods are? Uh, have you ever heard about sanitary pads, for example? You can talk to your kids about these questions. You come to know what they know, where they know from. So you can keep a check on whether the information is authentic or not. And of course, as far as safety behaviors are concerned, there are so many resource materials that are available. So whatever you think is most appropriate for you and your child, you can use that. There are these excellent web series. Uh, there's this uh, sex chat with Papu Ke Papa. Have you gone through this? It's amazing. So there's a little five-year-old kid and his papa, Papu and his papa, and they talk about various topics related to sexuality. It's an amazing uh, series. So fathers need to be involved. I see fewer men over here, but fathers need to be involved with both their boys and girls. Okay? So uh, there are many different things that you can do. There are many resources available. Point is, be proactive. If you just sit back and think that, okay, my child doesn't know, therefore nothing bad will happen, it's not going to work like that. Like you said, there is so much bombardment of information. One child in a class comes to know about something and everybody will come to know. And everyone will have their own imaginative ideas. So it's important to talk. Good afternoon, sir. Actually, I have noticed that in my school and even during my college classes, there are some students like seniors or juniors which get involved in such things or start passing comments which can be in included under sexual abuse. Yes. So what do you think like are the factors affecting this, neurolo neurological changes, except for that, is there some other factors which contribute for this? Uh, so sometimes it's also just a cultural thing. You know, if uh, my friends are saying something, I may tend to just follow it blindly without thinking what exactly is happening. Okay, so maybe I'm aware that what I'm doing is not right and the other person is suffering. But just to blend in, I give in to the peer pressure. So that's why sometimes people behave like this in a group. What can you do in such a situation is that you can go back and talk to the, uh, to the entire class maybe, that you attended a session about sexual harassment. It's important to make 
certain behaviors uh, classified under sexual harassment. You know, this whole uh, debate that started with the hashtag MeToo movement. Okay, the reaction by men is the most surprising part. I'm not surprised that over 90% of women are saying that me too, I was also harassed at some point. I'm not surprised with that. But what men are feeling is very surprising. They think that, no, that's not true. I don't think that uh, you were harassed. Tell me what happened to you. Uh, well, I was passing by and at a bus stop, somebody uh, looked at me or looked at my breasts or somebody uh, said something uh, about my body. Well, that doesn't classify as sexual harassment. People do that. So men do not understand that this is actually offensive to someone. This needs to be taught in school itself. At workplace, oh, I was just complimenting about your dress. You are looking so sexy. I didn't mean to offend you, but I am offended, right? So we need to teach appropriate, inappropriate behavior at every uh, possible situation, including personal relationships or professional workspace environments. And that's how we can probably change the behavior. Okay, so it's all right to do certain things in jest, in fun, as long as the other person is not feeling offended. This also includes uh, showing uh, anything of sexual nature to somebody else. For example, a lot of times people share sexual content on social media platforms. Now you need to have the consent of the other person to share something like this. You can't simply just show something to someone, look what I was watching or what I saw. Let's say there's a group of friends and they're just passing some kind of joke around them, between them, which is sexual in nature. Nobody is feeling offended. That's okay. But the moment somebody starts feeling hurt, offended, it stops being okay. Okay? So things like these need to be spoken about so that later on people are not confused whether this is harassment or simple, uh, you know, fun. Okay, so actually that's a very uh, dangerous line to walk on, <laughs> paraphilias and sexual offenses, because eventually everything boils down to human behavior. And when we talk about human behavior, everything boils down to the brain. If I see, say that a person who has raped another individual has done this because of the neuronal circuits, which is true, which is a fact, I'm somewhere probably on a moral level absolving this person of responsibility of the crime itself, okay? So actually the debate is about the uh, moral appropriateness of a certain act. It's not about what led to this act on a neurological level. That's only for science to study and probably to help us with the intervention program or rehabilitation programs. But when it comes to laws, ethics, there is a certain different set of principles that we need to take into account, okay? Thank you, Dr. Arman. Uh, you spoke about working with children with special needs. Uh, I mean, we are from social work background and we do work in a disability setting. And it's definitely an issue of concern, especially when we work with children with special needs. Uh, you were talking about this module. In fact, we contacted Dr. Neha as well. So how do you think, as social workers, we can bring in this component? Because uh, when you talk about signs and symptoms, uh, it becomes a little bit difficult to really understand uh, the aspect of sexual abuse, but we know that somewhere there is a problem. So how do you think we can intervene, especially when we work uh, in a special setting, like children with special needs? It's a very broad category, children with special needs, and every child would be different, okay? So it all boils down to how much the child can understand. Uh, in the school that um, we conducted the session uh, where kids have some special abilities, so uh, there was a group of, for example, three, four kids who had a lot of severe mental impairment. So regular talking to them, giving them instructions wouldn't work. So what we did with them was a part of a type of behavior therapy. We involved the teachers as well as the parents in the session. So the kids were sitting in the front row, the parents in the next row, and the teachers in the last row. We told the children to keep their, so a common problem there was that kids have started touching their private parts because they're growing older. Very normal thing to do in puberty, but not normal if you're doing it in a public place. But they cannot make out the difference. So we were just teaching them how to keep their hands on the table. And we were using, uh, you know, giving, giving them rewards if, it, if they were doing that. And we were just educating them about what is private and not private. 
After some time, we realized they didn't, don't get it. They don't understand the meaning of private. The word private was new to them. They are 13 to 16 years old, but they don't know the word private. So we started using the word secret because that's what they understood. So the message was delivered that this is secret. This cannot be done in front of others. Okay, so it will depend on how much the children can understand. Maybe you'll have to speak one-on-one. -on -one. You will have to involve the parents. You will have to involve the immediate caregivers. So I would, I wanted to know about marital rape. What are the lo laws for marital rapes? Because the number you gave, they said marital rape is not considered as an offense. That is what the answer 1098 has given me. If you go and file a complaint in police station, they say it would be considered under domestic violence and not sexual abuse. So what are the laws and how can no, That's that what the law is then. I mean, uh, you know the law. <laughs> that's what you're telling us that. that there is no law. Either. There's no law as of now about marital rape in our country. So hopefully things would change in the near future. Uh, doctor. <coughs> Doctor, do you can just tell me. As we talk about uh, bad touch and good touch, this has been going on for quite some time. Hello. I have a big question like, you know, uh, like a mother, normally she leaves her child Hello. at the age of three months or six months and goes to work. Hmm. And, and I have uh, known, especially given crisis and all, So let me answer the first uh, two questions because then I'll forget. <laughs> uh, the first question is about supervision. Uh, there are other ways to supervise your kid. CCTV camera, you can buy it on Amazon, connect it with Wi-Fi, have a live feed on your phone all the time. So I would suggest that a person who's leaving their very young child in another person's care, at least for the initial few months, do this supervision. Okay? Uh, you can even install this if you're, you have older kids but you have other help coming in your ho house on and off or someone is living in your house permanently. Uh, you can install the CCTV cameras in certain places where your kids go. Okay? So that's one way of supervising. Second question was about uh, the behavior that adults display towards children. Now it's very important to teach children uh, personal boundaries from a very young age. We were talking about good and bad touch. We should also talk about personal space. And, the, and one very efficient way of teaching this is by modeling it. So we tell parents that you may not be doing this with a bad intent, but the message that you're giving to the child is that if some adult touches you there, it's okay. It's in fun. Some adult asks you to slip, uh, sit on their lap, it's all right, you can go and sit on their lap. Now everyone may not do this with a, with a neutral or a good intent, 
there could be someone who is doing this with a very mal intent. So the child cannot distinguish. Better thing is to make these personal boundaries, that this one arm distance is your personal boundary. One way of teaching this is that, for example, you can make the child stand in a circle, draw a one arm distance radius around the child, and start walking towards the child. Am I in your personal boundary? Am I in your personal boundary? Am I in your personal boundary? Yes, now you are in my personal boundary. What, I'm, what are you supposed to do? Move back. And if I still come forward, say no. So you can demonstrate these things, make the child do it again and again. Just giving instructions is not enough. So make a child practice these things. So that's about personal boundaries. Of course, you can't probably sometimes say this to other people. But when it comes to your children, you have to tell others. Sometimes parents ask us this question. It may become very tricky. Some stranger comes and tries to you know, pick up my child or pull their cheeks. We do this. We don't respect personal boundaries, at least in our country. Okay. So what am I supposed to do? So if my child is saying no or stepping away, then it, the other person may feel offended. So we say that for the sake of your child, you need to tell that other person that, you know what, I'm teaching my child personal boundaries. And that's why my child is going to behave like this. And I want you to help me in, learning, uh, in uh, helping my child learn this. Okay? So I would like you to you know, ask my child whether you can shake his or her hand, whether you can pull their cheek, take consent. Okay, so yes, it will be tricky to begin with, but eventually people will comply. And the, four, the most important thing is the child's safety. So nothing is more important than that. Someone may get offended, but they can manage their emotions. My child doesn't know how to take care of himself or herself right now. So I have to be more pro towards that. Poxo. So uh, then the perpetrator basically will be considered as a juvenile offender. Okay, so recently, you know, uh, one incident happened. The perpetrator was not a minor, but a 20 year old boy. He's known to me. Um, and he was in a relationship with a 15 year old girl. Consent was there, but legally, 15 years old, you can't give consent. Uh, they got physically intimate, the girl got pregnant. And then they went to a hospital to uh, get the baby terminated, the pregnancy terminated. So of course, the hospital authorities had to know the girl's age. Once they came to know she's 15, they had to report it. It was mandatory. Nobody was offended, offended. He did not do this with a malintent. But he is behind bars for the past, past three months under the POXO Act now. Okay, So for everyone, this has to be remembered that Sexual relations with someone who's less than 18 years of age automatically is considered as rape. Whether the person can give consent or not, has given consent or not. Hello, hello. Yes. Absolutely. I would not say rape culture. But a lot of people who have become sexual offenders have themselves been victim of sexual offenses in their childhood. So just strictly talking about the neurological changes, Hello. there's something called as a temperament. Okay. Now let's say my temperament is a little aggressive and I have gone through some kind of abuse. Now my temperament would say fight back and that would make me more aggressive. But if my temperament is more towards anxiety side, and I've gone through some kind of abuse, my temperament would say, hide. Flight or fight reaction, right? So in the first instance, I have a fight reaction. In the second instance, I have a flight reaction. So in the first instance, I can become an aggressive person. So my temperament was there. Maybe I would have simply been a little more aggressive than others, but not an offender. But because of the childhood incidents, my brain has changed, and this is what it has resulted in. So yes, um, childhood experiences can definitely enhance, trigger, or reduce certain tendencies. That's why the intervention hello, programs hello, hello. for hello. people who could be potential perpetrators. Hello.
Right. Okay. Um, in the first case, it's again about drawing personal boundaries. Whether it's on social media platform or in person, you have to draw boundaries and say this is not okay. Don't do this ever again. If that person retracts and never does it again, fine. If he or she doesn't, then you break contact with that person. This is how you make sure that you are okay. In the second instance, uh, I hope you're not talking about normal sexual behavior. So there's something called as normal sexual behavior that is seen in children and in teens and in adults. So during teenage, some form of sexual experiences or experimentation is a normal thing. Of course, we have to educate people about the side effects of it. What can it lead to? Okay, making rash decisions, getting too close to somebody uh, physically may cause a lot of emotional issues as well. And I'm not just talking about the physical implications like teenage pregnancies or STIs. I'm talking about the emotional complications as well, which are very common. So we have to talk to kids about that, but certain things are normal sexual behavior, and they should be seen like that. However, if, as, as far as abuse is concerned, there have to be policies in every institute, in every place. Any more questions? That's not true. It simply is not true. It doesn't depend on what kind of clothes you wear or how you look like or how you walk, which community or culture you belong to. Like I said, it's an act of aggression. Okay, nobody has, uh, nobody asks for an act of aggression towards themselves. I mean, it's not justified. It's not, not a sexual act. When people are saying this, they are actually calling it a sexual act. That person looks sexually provocative and he or she wanted to have sex and that's why this happened. No. It's an act of violence. Sir, one second. One second. Sir, why do you think that talking about sex is a very big major issue in India rather compared to other countries? And do you think this contributes that a child stays quiet when he or she is sexually abused? Yes, definitely it contributes to not bringing such things out in the open. And it is um, awkward because we don't talk about it. It's like a vicious cycle. Anything that is not discussed often becomes awkward because it's something new. And then we also associate a lot of stigma towards it, that it's something uh, dirty, something wrong. When we talk to kids, they often tell us that, sir, I get dirty thoughts. Who told you that these thoughts are dirty? These are just thoughts. Your brain will generate some kind of thoughts depending on what, what your physiology is doing. If I'm hungry, it will generate thoughts about food. If I'm sexually aroused, it will generate thoughts about sex. So there's nothing dirty about it. That's one thing that we need to uh, know and pr probably propagate. But yes, it is awkward to talk about it because it's not spoken uh, often enough. So that's why these platforms are the opportunities where we can talk about these issues in a very factual manner. All right, so are we done with questions? Pedophilia is a mental illness. So what are the treatments actually you all give? Okay, uh, it's a very difficult, not just pedophilia, but sexual paraphilias are very difficult disorders to treat. Uh, certain medications do help depending on the symptoms. We can give medications to control impulsivity, to lower the sexual desire itself. Uh, psychodynamic psychotherapy has shown to be of some use. Uh, other forms of psychotherapy can also help, but that depends on how motivated the person is. I had uh, come across this uh, adolescent in, while, while I was working with an NGO that worked for street children. And uh, he told me that he is helpless. He cannot control his sexual impulses. And he has raped multiple girls. He's had unsafe sex with multiple uh, women and girls. And he just can't help himself. We tried medications. We tried counseling. He was like, no, I still can't control these impulses. And right now, I'm thinking about this particular person, actually an NGO worker. So uh, the last case resort was that he had to be admitted to the uh, legal cell in Thana Mental Hospital. Okay, so the last resort is of course imprisonment where there is a, there's an external physical control over their movement and over their behavior. But depending on the severity of symptoms, certain things may work. It's a difficult disorder to treat though. Uh, doctor, uh, here. Where? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, do the abusers come on their own for counseling as such or is it only when they are accused or something like how? 
So this boy came on his own. He was not accused. Um, I don't think that it's very, very common that abusers would themselves come unless they are aware that this is an abnormality and it would result in so and so things. Uh, one thing is also there that if the law is stringent, if law enforcement is stringent, then people would be more scared to act out certain impulses that they have. And probably that would motivate them to seek help for treating the impulses itself. Otherwise, they would feel that it's OK to act out these impulses because there is not much consequence. Okay? So people, for example, who do not uh, have very strong empathy, uh, who cannot understand that their actions can cause pain, may not feel remorse or guilt for their actions. In that situation, the practical consequences are something that may motivate them to seek help. Okay? Okay, and doctor, what about, you know, when we, uh, like, you know, there are small kids around uh, one and a half years or two years, you know, who try to touch uh, each other's private parts, like, what would be that like for? It's a normal sexual behavior. It's out of curiosity. Children are trying to learn about new things, explore things. So anything which is new to them, they would be interested in it. Okay? And anything that generates an emotional response from adults becomes a source of excitement and fun. So if the adults, so the adults can propagate this behavior by giving them extreme reaction, okay? So uh, both these factors are there. It's a normal sexual behavior, and of course, it could be enhanced because of the way adults react around them. Um, good afternoon, doctor. Thank you so much for this insightful uh, lecture. Uh, I have worked with juveniles for around four years. Uh, I have come across boys who have sexually abused other boys and girls. Right. Uh, and when you spoke about, you know, their childhood being, um, you know, they were abused as ch just children and then they kind of manifest that behavior on others. Uh, as a mental health professional, I do uh, empathize with those children. Um, but as a lay person, I do get angry. Uh, so what I want to know is, do we go back as a professional, should I go back to their childhood and treat that uh, incident, or should I focus on the present? Like Dr. Vaya said earlier, yeah. extinguish the fire yeah. first and then go to the right. circuit right. Yeah. that caused yeah. it. Yeah. So yes, of course, you have to do both. And as professional, you can use your emotions to guide you, yeah. but they can't really determine what exactly you're going to do. For okay. As professional, you have to rely on what science tells us. Okay. okay. Thank you so much for being such a great audience. It was lovely speaking with you.